Okay, lige til det her. Oh, oh, Bhagavad Gita, in which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself, and which was composed of 18 chapters within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O oh, Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us, O oh, Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows. The milker is the cowherd boy, Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. People of purified intellect are the drinkers. And the milk is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent, and, and the, the crippled, crippled cross, cross mountains. When the uh, when I would play harmonium to accompany you, I had to play it so softly <laughs> so that you could hear. <laughs> now we can go for it. Awesome. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, Swamiji, just um, and your voice used to squeak <laughs> in a way, and now that deep, rich resonant yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, devotion always opens the real voice. <laughs> yeah, it's something. So um, here's where we'll pick up this morning. We just. We've just come through, of course, Lord Krishna answers the question that Arjuna asked, and he didn't just simply answer it, he answered it so fully and completely. And then he provided all of these possibilities. And by the way, if you can't keep my mind, keep your mind on me fixed all of the time, then practice Abhyasa Yoga, just try to do it. And if you can't do that, then devote your actions to me. And if you can't do that, <laughs> then just give me all of your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> just take shelter in me. Yes. Mm -hmm. And give me your evil deeds, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Just give it to me. I'll take, I'll pure it, and I will purify all of it and give you back yourself Such in me. Such a wide open door, you know, like yes. putting a, a camel through a needle hole. Yes. The needle hole is that big. Oh. And within those stanzas really are all of the practices of all of the religions mm -hmm. um, in terms of how people approach the, the one in all of these different ways. And then he has a summary really of that this morning. Um, which wants a little bit of discussion, a beautiful summary. It speaks of practice and, and such. And here, um, knowledge is indeed better than practice. I'll read it and then we'll break it down a bit and discuss. Knowledge is indeed better than practice. And often we'll see in parentheses, mindless practice to, to differentiate ways to practice, and, and we'll discuss that a bit. Meditation is better than knowledge. Renunciation of the fruits of action is better than meditation. Peace immediately follows renunciation. Um, so here a little bit first in terms of, uh, in terms of putting some parameters with the practice. So you know what happens with practice is um, whatever we're practicing. At first, when we practice, we practice intentionally. We have intention behind it. We know why it is that we're taking on the practice. You know, if you're practicing get on, getting up early in the morning. At first, you know why you're doing it. And you have to struggle to do it, right? And you have to really have that that knowing of why you're doing it in order to be able to do it. But after some time, 
Um, and the getting up early wouldn't necessarily be a good example, but but there are good examples in terms of chanting mantras and repeating prayers and all of this. After some time, we get it memorized. And because now it's memorized, and now we do it by rote or routinely, then we, <clears throat> we lose the connection with it. We had the connection with it when we were first beginning to practice it because we knew what it, we took the time to know what it meant, right? And to imbue it with, with this, to imbue the practice. But then it, when it becomes memorized, and we often see this, the, the, and, and we see it really in all the traditions, in all aspects of life. And so this first knowledge is better than practice. It's referring to really that rote kind of practice where one is practicing without making the connection. So knowing why one practices is more important than the practice itself first. Uh, and then he goes on. And, what's, and what is better than knowledge? He says meditation. You know, he's not speaking of Raja Yoga meditation here. He's not speaking of, uh, of again, uh, a systematic practice of withdrawing the sense objects, etc. He's speaking really more of contemplation, mm -hmm. where, the, um, where we really deeply consider the subject. Mm. So, and we'll take a little bit of commentary here from, from Swamiji, Swami Chinmayananda about it. Um, whenever we deeply consider a subject, if, if the mind is focused upon it, we glean deeper knowledge of it. This is demonstrated by science, for example. When someone keeps asking the question, what is the cause of this, uh, this effect? After some time, especially with practice, some answers will begin to come. And where do they come from? Of course, they come from intuition. So they're unveiled or revealed, right? Um, even someone, a botanist, for example, again, the sciences, who asks, <clears throat> how does this tree function? And keeps asking the question and keeps looking at it and looking at it and parsing it a bit and looking at it. In time, some, some deeper understanding of it comes, right? Yeah, makes sense? How are you looking at you? Can you relate to what's, okay. So this kind of meditation, um, so if I meditate on you, dear Lord, if I meditate on you, dear Lord, does that mean that I just sit here and repeat your name all of the time? Well, that's, that's a practice. But if I just do it by road, if I just repeat over and over again, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, well, it's a heck of a lot better than going to the bar. <laughs> it's a heck of a lot better than most anything that we could do in this world. Huh? It's a lot better than arguing about politics or religion or calling people out or judging them or any of the things that we normally get involved in. Mm -hmm. Repeating Om Namah Shivaya at least takes all that stuff away. <laughs> but if I chant Om Namah Shivaya in, in, a, in an honest and earnest attempt to relate to Shiva and to come deeper in awareness of Shiva and deeper in knowing of Shiva, then do you see something different will come from that? Yeah. yeah? Ah. So last night, a beautiful example of that with St. Joseph of Cupertino. Mm. So you didn't see all of the inner, and it's not that there was a lot of mental activity going on, but there was very deep meditation. In other words, meditation coming into union with the Divine Mother. Uh, so, and normally when we relate to intuitive flow, we'll have an idea of it in words. So you wouldn't have seen it in words, but you saw a connection come, right? So this is also meditation. Meditation upon the Divine. 
Often in Raja Yoga meditation, we're not really meditating upon the divine. We say this, but often the practice, if we're doing japa, for example, is repeating the mantra, really meditating upon the divine. Mm. Yeah. Um, in a way, you could say yes, because it does purify. But is it possible to go deeper in it? And you say, yeah, that's possible as well. So uh, meditation is better than knowledge. So, dear Lord, I know that you are the reality of this world. Okay. I can know it. But how do I live it? And is there a difference between knowing it and living it? Yeah. Right? In, in living it, you actually come to understand it, not just know it. Right. All the time we're saying, I know, I know, I know. But in living it, and, and this meditation or contemplation is a part of living it. So on, on pilgrimage, I would always ask of the Lord how to serve you. And this was like a constant flow. And I would listen, listen, listen. And some example would come of how to serve. Aha, of course, yes. So this, this communication, which became communion, right? And so is there meditation? Yeah, absolutely. My mind was single pointed on the Lord in conversation with the Lord, asking, communicating, listening, observing, looking for signs everywhere, recognizing you'll answer me, but you'll answer me maybe in a word, maybe in a passerby, maybe in something right in front of me. If I ask how to serve you, dear Lord, and I'm walking along and I see some nails in the road, what do you suppose I consider that as? Opportunity to serve. And is it communication? Mm. <laughs> right? Is it an accident? No, I mean, <laughs> clearly if you're actually observing, you see, no, it's a communication. It's a nonverbal communication. Uh, so there's practice of meditation there, which is just constantly looking to see what's the answer to this question. Does that make sense? Does it relate? Uh, so meditation in this way. So knowledge is better than practice, just the rote practice, the empty practice. That's what's being talked about. Practice, of course, is required to perfect knowledge. But then, the, but then meditation is this contemplation and this real active, active, single-pointed practice with the object of devotion. So we could say, I want to understand your ways more clearly, dear Lord. And then we can watch and observe and see something. And then finally, Finally, renunciation of the fruits of action is better than meditation. And um, peace immediately follows renunciation. So that brought this, which is the, which is the first of the relinquishments that Peace Pilgrim talks about in uh, Steps Towards Inner Peace. First one, relinquishment of self-will. She says, you have, or it's as though you have two selves, the lower self that usually governs you selfishly and the higher self, which stands ready to, go, to use you gloriously. You must subordinate the lower self by refraining from doing the not good things you are motivated towards, not suppressing them, but transforming them so that the higher self can take over your life. And I'm actually looking for a little bit more commentary from her on it. Let's see if we have it. Yeah, we do. Now the last part, these are the relinquishments. Once you've made the first relinquishment, you have found inner peace because it's the relinquishment of self-will. Do you see the connection between what Krishna is saying and what she's saying here? It's the same, isn't it? She says, as soon as you relinquish 
self-will, which is the, um, the desire to do something for the fruit so that I can have the fruit. Mm. Right? Then, once you've made the first relinquishment, you have found inner peace. So she doesn't even say that it's a time, that you have to wait some period of time for it. And here Lord Krishna says, peace immediately follows renunciation. So um, once you've made the first relinquishment, you found inner peace because it's the relinquishment of self-will. You can work on this by refraining from doing any not good things you may be motivated toward, but you never suppress it. You're motivated to do or say a mean thing. You can always think of a good thing. You deliberately turn around and use that same energy to do or say a good thing instead of instead. And she says it works. So she's talking about how um, and then not for nothing. The, um, we were discussing some yesterday, and this is for us, and it's for everybody who who participates in this, joins us online, etc. Common idea of relinquishment of self-will or renunciation is the same idea I had when I ran off to India, which is renouncing my duties. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> that would be renunciation. <laughs> renouncing my actions, that would be renunciation, in particular the ones I didn't like. <laughs> and of course what we learn uh, is we can't actually renounce those uh, I mean we can but it never works out well <laughs> so of course the renunciation that's being talked is discussed is the expectation of fruit yeah. either 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 raga duresha, either either fruit in terms of avoidance of pain, or fruit in terms of of pleasurable rewards. So that's whenever we talk about renunciation. Here it's chaga. Chaga is um, chaga means renunciation of fruit. And Swamiji actually says later on, it's renunciation of the expectation of the fruit. There's actually nothing wrong with having the fruit either. So the so it can be said that the fruit of renunciation is peace. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with having peace. <laughs> so even if you renounce, you get something. <laughs> but if you renounce with the expectation of getting something, then you won't have peace. <laughs> if you go into it saying, I'm going to have peace, and if I don't get peace, then I'm not going to do this, then you're always going to be looking at it to see if the peace is acceptable or not. <laughs> and you'll be considering whether you continue doing or not doing whatever you're doing or not doing. <laughs> So, uh, so there is fruit, and it's okay to enjoy the fruit. In fact, it's wonderful to enjoy the fruit. The only issue that we, that we encounter is the expectation of it. That's actually the, the crux of it, the expectation of it. Um, because wherever there's an expectation, there's a rough edge. Right? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, we're going to continue. The, these, there are eight more shlokas, and they're all strung together. They're like, sorry? I just wanted to ask something. Yes, yes, please. Going back to the MK practices. Yes. So we're saying contemplate the divine, for example, and uh, repeating japa. So those are two separate practices. So combining them together, that would take, seems to me that that would take a lot of mental power. To ah, so... Let's say it this way. 
um, practice in a way that's not dry. Can you practice in a way that's not dry? Mm -hmm. when, it, when you begin the practice, can you devote the practice in some way? Can you contemplate? Can you consider why you're going to be practicing whatever you're going to be doing? And then when you practice it, can you really put the bhava into it? So this morning, for example, in chanting of kirtan, the last couple of days it's been a little bit dry. So Swami took a little bit of time and said, it's not going to be dry this morning. You know, sometimes when there are, when there are only four or five, six of us in, in satsang, then and some of you, when you chant, it's like you're in Raja Yoga meditation because the, you're just not into it at all. And if you're not into it, you're not going to get much from it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just like being repeated because it's memorized or something like that. And, and so the intention was, okay, let's bring some bhava into this this morning. Let's really amp this up a little bit and intentionally do it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what, what do you feel from the practice? You feel more of the bhava from the practice as well. Uh, so like that. Well, like that. Does it mean that there's a constant, um, constant contemplation while you're practicing? No, that that probably not possible. <laughs> but contemplation prior to the practice, mm. yeah, and um, yeah, and and then bhava really practicing in a way that you're not separating yourself from the meaning of the practice. Practice in a way where you are uniting yourself with the meaning of the practice. So I chant this, dear Lord, I chant your name in order to be with you, in order to propitiate you, in order to honor you, in order to thank you. And then really practice in this way. And then it's not a dry practice. Right? Still we use the memorization and all of that. I mean, the memorization will be there anyway. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Setting the intention, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. And and understanding why you're setting that intention, you know. Um, and then do it as an offering. Really do it as an offering. Um, something that that happened, and I can't take credit for anything. I just share stuff. So um, there was an idea that came, you know, after chanting a mantra. Uh, especially in groups, will feel that that oh, that bliss, right? Sometimes it's very intense, isn't it? That wave is it just waves through, and like, oh. and so uh, somehow is given the idea, offer that back. Yeah. And so I do, and starts to come. Oh dear Lord, this is for you. And it just gets stronger. <laughs> and I offer it more. <laughs> Do with it as you will. This is not mine. This is yours. It's for you. I offer it back to you. <laughs> Swamiji oh. is also offering to every thing, everyone. Yeah, everyone. offering it out. Etc. Yes. It's not to stay here. <laughs> um, so, in, in other words, it's fine to enjoy the fruit, but but actually, as it's passing through you, then then the bliss is the fruit, and so. But if you try to keep it for yourself, if you try to hoard it. Then it's gone in an instant. <laughs> Just like money. Sorry? Just like money. Ah, of course, money is also God. Like anything. <laughs> like anything. Oh. Oh. Okay. So these eight, um, we read them yesterday and we'll read, we'll read them one more time. We'll just read but a little bit of what Swamiji, Swami Venkatesh has to say about them. Um, the eight concluding verses of this chapter are thrilling and superb. It says they're called the Amritash to come, uh, the immortal eight. Krishna, who has said that there was none dear or antagonistic to him, 
suddenly declares that there are some who are extremely dear to him. Who they are and what their nature is, he describes in these eight verses. Um, in a way, it's like the Beatitudes with Jesus, and maybe you can hear that as you, as you hear these. So he starts here. He who hates no creature, who is friendly <clears throat> and compassionate to all, who is free from attachment and egoism, balanced in pleasure and pain and forgiving, ever content, steady in meditation, self-controlled, possessed of firm conviction with the mind and intellect offered to me, he, my devotee, is dear to me. He by whom the world is not agitated and who cannot be agitated by the world, who is freed from joy, envy, fear, and anxiety, he is dear to me. He who is free from wants, pure, expert, unconcerned, and untroubled, renouncing all undertakings or commencements, he who is thus devoted to me is dear to me. He who neither rejoices nor hates, nor grieves nor desires, renouncing good and evil, and who is full of devotion is dear to me. He who is the same to foe and friend, and also in honor and dishonor, who is the same in cold and heat and in pleasure and pain, who is free from attachment, he to whom censure and praise are equal, who is silent, content with anything, homeless, of a steady mind and full of devotion. That one is dear to me. They verily who follow this immortal dharma as described above, endowed with faith, regarding me as their supreme goal, they, the devotees, are exceedingly dear to me. So we can come back and discuss a little tomorrow, but I think we get the feeling for them, yes? Uh, this immortal dharma, this is actually the word immortals being being translated from sanatana, sanatana, sanatana. This is called sanatana dharma, the, um, what's called Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism, Hindu is a Western word. The, the European, uh, Europeans who came to conquer India called the people of the Indus Valley, Indus or Hindus, and that's where the, that's where the term came from. But the peoples, said that they were practicing sanatana dharma, the immortal or timeless dharma, the timeless law. And so those verily who follow this immortal dharma are described above, endowed with faith, regarding me as their supreme goal, they, the devotees, are exceedingly dear to me. Serve, love, give, purify, meditate, realize, be good, do good, be kind, be compassionate, bear insult, bear injury. Uh, I missed adapt, adjust, accommodate, did I? Bear insult, bear injury, highest sadhana, bear insult, bear injury, highest yoga, inquire who am I and know thyself and be free. So the sanatana dharma, the immortal dharma. You hear... Swami Shivananda's kirtan, serve, love, give. Do you hear that in these? Yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah, he's just paraphrasing them. <laughs> okay. Any comments, questions, anything? So that would, that would um, give a description of a jiva mutta too? Well, here this is practice. Um, to the Jivan Mukta, um, it's simply the, the way of life. Um, we practice it. The, the, and when we say something like that, this, this beautiful discussion with Nisargadatta comes up where someone was talking with, with Nisargadatta and, and really was 
was not seeing the value in practicing like this. Um, his idea was, was, I am that already. <laughs> so what's with these people who practice this? And Nisargadatta, who one would normally have thought would have said, yeah, no value in practice because you are that already, said, actually, he said, one who practices being a saint, not taking credit for it, that's called sadhana. <laughs> and of course, the practice, intentional practice, yes. as Lord Krishna is describing here, reveals the self in all of its glory. And the self in all of its glory, acting through the instrument, then naturally engages in this way. See, uh, very So, oh, normally when we say practice, it's it's intentional. It's you know we're contemplating the practice, etc. We're contemplating the choices. What are the opportunities and and how to live and how to be? Uh, um, I don't suppose Krishna is contemplating how to be. Um, yeah, Krishna is instead giving us the, the inspiration and the example of how to be and sharing the practice of how to be who we are. Yeah. Oh. Beautiful question, beautiful thought. Thank you, Har. Um, anything else? It's a beautiful chapter, isn't it? Yes. We're at the end. Tomorrow we'll close it and move to the move to the thirteenth chapter. Quite profound. Uh, did you enjoy the? We had read yesterday the entire chapter from the Sir Edwin Arnold, the poetic version. Did you enjoy it? Uh, we have a hard copy of that coming. It'll be here in the next couple of days. We'll place it here in case anyone wants to pick it up and read it. It's you, the other chapters as well. It's quite. It's a beautiful way to approach the Gita. It doesn't have the depth of the commentary, but still, um, I've never seen um, an English translation that captures the bhava of the Sanskrit, and uh, somehow he got that part of it, the feeling of it. Um, you know, living in India, and I was in India for a little over a year, but being exposed to, to sadhana and the approach of sadhana there, even householders in the villages will commonly repeat the Gita shlokas um, daily, very common to memorize as a child Bhagavad Gita and then repeat the shlokas one chapter a day, something like that. Um, and then for special occasions, just sit and repeat in Sanskrit the entire Bhagavad Gita from, from beginning to end. And from beginning to end, it's repeated in about um, 45 minutes or so, something like that. And so for one who has a vibrational understanding of Sanskrit, it's quite powerful. Um, this Sir Edwin Arnold piece, the poetry is the same, to read the entire Bhagavad Gita, about 45 minutes, something like that. And, uh, and it's a, just a beautiful approach to it. So I'm recommending it. I, I looked around and saw that it wasn't here. I don't, I don't know, I'm sure it's here somewhere. But I thought we should have a copy, so if anyone, I'll let you know when it comes. If anyone would like to just sit and take some time with it and read all the way through, it's, it's wonderful. Okay, we'll close. Final prayers in RT. Page 174. Om, Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugandim Pushti Vajanam or I will never abandon on my soul, Muxia, Mamritat. 
Om Chayambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Orgai Rukameva Bandhanam Mrichor Mukshyam Amritat Om Chayambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Orgai Rukameva Bandhanam Mrichor Mukshyam Amritat Om Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu Sarve Sham Shantir Bhavatu, Sarve Sham Purnam Bhavatu, Sarve Sham Mangalam Bhavatu, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Shantu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashanto Makashi Dukabhad Pave, Asatoma Sat Gamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityor Maam Mrityam Gamayam Om Purnamida Purnamidam Purna Purnamudashate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vasishate Om Shanti 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 Adorable Lord of mercy and love Salutations and prostrations unto Thee. Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient. Thou art Satchitananda. Thou art existence, knowledge and bliss absolute. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptation and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, anger, greed, hatred, and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms. Let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. Humble of Sakura Shivananda Marjaki. And for all of the saints and sages of all the traditions. Jai. 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 Jai.